Because of the following CBS News special report, the program normally seen at this time will not be presented today. They, uh, we can't reach those big guns and they just keep dropping in. There's nothing you can do. It's like being a big bullseye on top of a hill. And uh, you're just sitting there waiting. You can't be safe, you can be lucky. That's it. You can't be safe, you can be lucky. That's it. Stuff landing all over, bouncing off you. And uh, you get just as scared every time. And it gets worse. The closer they get, the more they throw. The more you get scared. Then you get up. It's a wonderful feeling just to be alive, to be able to walk around after one of those. If I live 100 years, I'll just never, ever be able to, uh, to, to tell the, the story uh, the way it really happened. These young kids who, uh, you just run up to them, and uh, when we were all boxed in, they were all around, and they were all over our perimeter, and we're throwing grenades, and I uh, got pretty close, and. Uh, just run up to one of these kids and say, uh, Marine, we're going to get out of here, aren't we? And uh, the kid look up to you and say, you're damn right we are, Skipper. Those Marines are talking about a place named Con Tien, an obscure American outpost in Vietnam, as Tarawa, Iwo Jima, and Guadalcanal were once obscure. Con Tien is a bitterly exposed target just two miles below the DMZ. American Marines have been under fire there since last May. In just the last four weeks, they have suffered over 70 dead, 1,000 wounded. In the next half hour, we shall examine the ordeal of Con Tien. This is a CBS News special report. The ordeal of Con Tien. This broadcast is brought to you by West... Here is CBS News correspondent Mike Wallace. Con Tien is here. Two miles south of the demilitarized zone at the narrow top of South Vietnam, 12 miles inland from the South China Sea. It is a desolate hilltop collection of guns and bunkers looking north across the DMZ into North Vietnam. Its crucial importance lies in the fact that it's on a main infiltration route into the south. The loss of Con Tien could help open the way for the estimated 35,000 communist troops now massed in the DMZ area. Its loss would block the construction of that electronic barrier along the DMZ to seal off South Vietnam from the north. But more than that, its loss would give the North Vietnamese that one big elusive propaganda victory they've been searching for at such a cost in lives. They would prize a victory at Con Tien as a miniature replica of their victory over the French at Dien Bien Phu in 1954. Con Tien is vulnerable. It is the least defensible of any of the American outposts because it's so close to North Vietnamese territory. The enemy artillery, about 100 big guns plus mortars and rockets, can pound Con Tien around the clock with devastating effect. And our ground troops cannot go into North Vietnam to knock out those guns. For the Marines at Con Tien, this is what it's like.
Put your arm around. Make sure you have to hear the radio. Hey, I'm going to give you a hand. Yeah, I'm going to make it. Okay, just take it easy. Keep your head down, okay? Take it easy, Red. should be able to see right. that as well, isn't it, Wave? Let's get them on there. Over. Hey, look, you can't get a grid out of bird stick. Okay, look, here are the two tacks. You see them? Yes, sir. You see where that smoke is? Sure. That, that but the smoke landed about 300 meters, right where that big tree is out there, 300 to 400 meters, uh, southeast of the Okay, we got it. What happened to your squad? Uh, they was hit. Most of them was hit by shrapnel, mm -hmm. and there was medevac. Well, tell me, uh, you came here at full strength? Uh, I had 13 men when I came. And it's four days later now, and how many are still here? Six. I think we're just uh, occupying ground and uh, losing too many men. I'm losing too many men. If we were to stay here too much longer, we we wouldn't have much left of this platoon, let alone the company. Uh, I see. What, about three, four people get it a day? Uh, not, not real bad, but enough to be medevac. Cut my platoon down. Well, isn't that all part of war, as the generals say? Sure it is, but for seven months up here, one battalion ain't gonna have much left if, if that's part of war. That'll rotate a little more, I think. Send us back where we can get new men and train them. See, we're getting new men out here. They're coming out, well, what you might call green, and then they, they don't know really how to act. The rifles have been jamming, the, the mud's been, uh, has slowed everything down, and the artillery comes in everywhere, and uh, just gets pretty futile and frustrating sometimes. Well, the really depressing part about it is, uh, like, there isn't really much you can do, you know what I mean? You see the rounds come in, you see your buddies get blown away and wounded, and 
and stuff like that. Well, I can't say that I'm scared stiff, but I'm scared. I mean, after a while, you know it's going to come. You can't do nothing about it. And you just look to God. It's about the only thing you can do. Well, do you get any idea from up around Kanchen how the war is going? Yes. If we, uh, if we don't get some more people up in this area real quick, and we don't get some more B-52s real fast, then these people are going to be all the way down to Da Nang before anybody knows it. Does everybody agree with that? 100%. What kind of support are the Marines getting? General Westmoreland says the Americans are responding with the greatest concentration of conventional firepower in history. The U.S. artillery fire is ten times greater than the enemy's. It comes from Dong Ha, Cam Lo, Jo Lin, the other outpost corners of what is called Leatherneck Square, and from these big guns at Camp Carroll. The batteries fire off as many as 10,000 shells daily, lobbing them over the heads of the men at Contien deep into the demilitarized zone. And then there are the B-52 bombers striking from nearby Thailand. They pound the zone day in, day out with tons of explosives. With this saturation, why haven't the North Vietnamese positions been destroyed? Marine commanders say the enemy guns most of them highly mobile, roll in and out of deep caves and tunnels. Only a direct hit can silence them. And there has been no silence at Contien. The story of how Contien came to be a miniature Korea began last May. The Marines there were in construction battalions, clearing strips to help protect against attacks. The outpost was little more than a few trenches dug on a hilltop, still green and unscorched, manned by 300 South Vietnamese civilian irregulars advised by a handful of American Special Forces troops. The few bunkers looked more like temporary homes for the men who were there to operate the graders and earth movers. But they were some protection against occasional artillery attacks. Then things got rougher. On the morning of May the 9th, burning tanks and personnel carriers marked a battle that had begun at 2.30 a.m. and lasted till after daybreak. The hilltop was strewn with dead. 200, 200 of them, like this one. North Vietnamese regulars. The enemy had struck with a force of 1,200 men. Captured enemy weapons were gathered from all over the perimeter. The cost to the Americans in that first battle at Contien included 124 wounded. Of these, 110 were Marines, the rest Special Forces men. And there were our own dead, 44 Americans altogether, all of them Marines, the first to fall at Contien. For the next few months, there was less action than preparation for action. The Marines had come to stay, to take control of Contien from the South Vietnamese. The plan now was to establish a post on the hilltop that could be more easily defended. That meant more bunkers and well-protected gun emplacements. The expectation then was for another ground assault. Enemy artillery was fairly inactive until July when it got busier. The Americans retaliated with airstrikes. For the rest of July and August, the Marines at Contien used their own guns to good effect. The ammunition, an endless supply, came in daily, and it was used up daily. This was the end of a supply lifeline that began in Da Nang and arrived at Contien by way of Dong Ha, six miles to the south. And there were tents nearby to house a complement that included about a thousand men. No matter how you look at it, those were better days. There was more time for things like the casual cleaning of weapons. But nothing at Contien has been casual since September came. For the first 25 days of this month, Contien had to fight back against ground assaults and a sudden calculated escalation of enemy artillery, the most intense artillery barrage of the war. At times, the shouts of incoming could be heard above the noise of our own guns. There has been a slight let up in the last few days, but Marines still must patrol the perimeter of Contien, and for these men, the danger is multiplied by the threat of ambush. The kind of war that's going on around Contien inspired one young Marine to put his feelings 
into a poet. When youth was a soldier and I fought across the sea, we were young and cold hearts, a bloody savagery, born of indignation, children of our time. We were orphans of creation and dying in our prime. What made you write that poem? Well, just the way things are. The commanders in Vietnam, the men who must decide when ordeals must be born, look at the ordeal at Contien from a different vantage point. We talked with General William Westmoreland, commander of American ground forces, and Lieutenant General Robert Cushman, who commands the Marines there. There have been some questions from outside and in your own command structure, all the way down to some privates I met on Contien about the defense of that outpost, and some who perhaps aren't as confident as the general may be. Well, uh, when you sit in a place such as that and uh, night comes on, uh, you really have to rely upon yourself and upon supporting fires. And uh, naturally, uh, the confidence uh, uh, may not be as great as uh, it is back here, uh, where I can see the many forces that can be brought to bear, and which those right on the spot uh, may not be aware. Uh, I am confident that we can uh, hold this area, and uh, we have been doing it. Furthermore, uh, from what reports we've had uh, from prisoners and documents, uh, we've been hurting the enemy badly. They have attempted to uh, make it appear that they are winning a military victory. Uh, their target is American public opinion. Uh, they had hoped that by inflicting these casualties, it being fully understood by them that the casualties inflicted upon uh, their ranks were unknown to us, that they would uh, achieve uh, their psychological victory. And this is the only way they can conceivably win this war. Contien, then, you're saying, is not really a military action, but a political or psychological warfare action. Uh, precisely. Their objective is political and psychological. It is designed to weaken the will of the American people to uh, make it appear in uh, American and public and uh, world opinion that uh, they are stronger than they are in fact and to uh, uh, discourage uh, our uh, resolve. We asked two of our CBS News correspondents who've been under fire with the Marines at Contien for an assessment of the situation there. John Lawrence and Robert Shackney. We asked them first, what are the Marines saying right now about Contien. Well, Mike, if the Marine happens to be an infantryman, he feels that he'd rather be someplace else. I've heard a lot of Marines say that Contien is a very poor place to defend because the Marines can't move out on the ground with infantrymen and with tanks to attack the positions from which the North Vietnamese are firing their artillery. That's on the other side of the border. Now, if the Marines were to pull back five or ten miles in the North Vietnamese were to follow them with their artillery, then the communists would no longer be invulnerable from Marine counterattack on the ground. The Marine riflemen on Kan Chen, or grunts as they call themselves, would rather be anywhere, out on an operation marching or back at the rear sleeping, anywhere but Kan Chen. In their simple teenage philosophy, they don't understand the significance of holding on to what you've got, or as it's said in the Orient, saving face. The Pentagon gives orders to the generals, and the generals give order to the colonels, and so on, and all the orders are obeyed. But the grunts don't seem to understand that they're holding Kan Tien because of a Pentagon decision to win the war with a kind of modern Maginot line that hasn't been built yet. And what lies ahead for Kan Tien in the coming weeks? There's not likely to be much change, Mike, as long as the monsoons last. The heavy range is supposed to start this month and their last two or three months and during that period it's unlikely that the Marines can reopen the roads. The Marines say that they can resupply themselves for defensive purposes with helicopters but all that's very limited. The Marines won't be able to move out and in force until the road dries out. Now whether the North Vietnamese are going to use this period to continue to shell the Marines or whether they'll try something more substantial is of course something that nobody on this side can answer. But during the monsoons Contien is most isolated, air power is most limited, and the Marines will be most vulnerable. The big question really seems to be whether or not the North Vietnamese intend to overrun Contien. The Marines have tripled the number of troops guarding the outpost, and they've moved up more battalions to be ready to reinforce. 
If the North Vietnamese decide to attack Han Tien, they must know it will cost them between five and 10,000 casualties. They've only decided to do that once before, in 1954, when they felt it would be the final victory, and it was. But the United States could survive the loss of Khan Tien, get more troop backs, and retake it. So it would not seem to be in the best interest of the North Vietnamese to attack Khan Tien in the near future. They'll probably continue to shell it, and the Marines will continue to take it. Two years ago, when the first of 500,000 Americans began settling into their enclaves here, with the fresh Pentagon promises of a quick victory, the generals were promoting the new military strategy of the air mobile offense. Now, in the light of Khan Chen, the generals are explaining their successes with the words, mobile defense. Mobile defense seems to mean putting 3,000 men on the ground and allowing them to sit in the mud and wait for the shell with their name on it. The military can no longer justify this war with a casualty count. It may be that more Marines are dying along the DMZ than enemy. Anyway, no one doubts General Giap's strategy of sacrificing 10 of his own for one American, and few here believe our own exaggerated guesses at enemy casualties. The Marines have not run any operations into the DMZ since this summer because there are not enough regiments to be sure of victory. They stay fairly close to their bases, to within a few hundred yards for most. It begins to sound like a conventional war with a conventional front. And in a few years, the Marines who have come down off Khan Chen will talk as proudly as those who came back from the Chosan Reservoir. What it all seems to mean is that American Marines have been committed to protect a key outpost along a cleared, fortified barrier it was originally conceived in controversy and at present cannot be constructed. What seems to be overlooked is the ability of the North Vietnamese to escalate this war step by step with Washington. You begin to suspect that we've reached the limits of our present strategy when the generals are talking openly about an invasion of the North and the men around Khan Chen are talking about the need for tactical nuclear weapons. There seems little doubt that it is the administration's resolve to stay at Khan Tien. The president made that clear last Friday night in his speech to the nation, when he pointed to the Marines up at the DMZ as the real peacekeepers. Lyndon Johnson understands that a defeat or even a withdrawal now at Khan Tien could be for him a political Dien Bien Phu. The president's dilemma is how to persuade the North Vietnamese to quit up there. Up to now, pure firepower hasn't done it. And it seems unlikely that he would order American troops into North Vietnam to do the job. Moscow and Peking would be bound to react sharply to such an escalation. Meantime, for the Marines at Contien, the months ahead look grimmer than ever. The fall monsoon rains have just begun. They will go on till February, hampering American air power, depriving the men on the ground of at least some of the air support they desperately need. The artillery duel at Contien will go on and on. This battle is different from any other action in the war in that there is no let up. Day after unchanging day. And as long as the North Vietnamese can resupply their troops and guns, as long as they can send down reinforcements, there is little the Marines can do about it. Mike Wallace, CBS News, New York. CBS News film cameraman at Contien, Keith K, Gerard P, John Smith, Carl Sorensen, Kurt Bogert, PB1. And the CBS News sound men, Pam Van Wey, Baloop Rod Boone, Fan Chan, Phanong Hiransi, D.V. Ree, Pam Tan Don. This has been a CBS News special report. The ordeal of Contien. This broadcast has been brought to you by Western Electric, the manufacturing and supply unit of the Bell System, as part of their continuing coverage of important news events. The preceding program was a CBS News special report. Programs regularly scheduled at this time will return next Sunday.